Paris, 2003. A silent and invisible killer kills 5,000 people. They were perfectly well. Six hours later, they were very sick. A few days later, most of them were dead. It happened before eight years earlier in Chicago. More than 700 people lost their lives. I didn't know if I was going to survive, if I was going to make it. It's, it's not a joke. It's not a media hype. The heat is a killer. The killer is weather, hot weather. Heat waves that experts call extreme heat events. And they warn that these events will happen again and again. How did something as simple as hot weather endanger and kill so many people? And what can be done to prevent heat waves from killing in the future? without a sound, and the destruction they leave behind is mostly invisible. Yet heat waves are surprisingly lethal. Heat waves are the most deadly of the natural disasters. They kill more than the combined effects of hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, blizzards. The heat wave of 1980 resulted in an estimated 10,000 excess deaths across the United States. Despite their deadly potential, cities have been slow to take protective action. It would take an extreme heat wave in Europe to galvanize world attention to the real dangers of heat. August 2003, a large hot air mass from the Sahara settles over much of Europe. Within a week, the invisible but oppressive heat becomes a news story. Thousands of acres of forests burn in Portugal. Record temperatures are set in London. But the most stunning effect of the heat wave would not be apparent for some time, and that was the number of casualties. Over 50,000 people in Europe were killed by the heat. Few cities suffered more fatalities than Paris. The heat wave moves in August 1st, and as it moves in, many Parisians are heading out of town, an annual migration known as the August Vacation. Left behind at the mercy of the escalating and deadly heat is a large and vulnerable population. By August 5th, the mercury climbs to over 100 degrees. Therese Belanger, a local postal worker, has become friends with many of the elderly people on her route. When temperatures soar, she naturally worries. Sure enough, many of them are feeling the effects of the heat. I found them to be pale or they didn't move around a lot when usually they were people who talked a great deal. They hardly spoke to me. They answered with a single sentence, short words. I thought, something's going on. They're not well at all. Also alert to the situation, emergency room doctor Patrick Pelou. At the beginning of August, we began seeing the first cases we had never seen before coming in. In other words, elderly people mostly, who were coming in with temperatures of up to 107. As the days progress, the situation gets much worse. People begin dying. We saw two categories mostly. Very old people coming in the emergency room with hypotension and high-grade fever, and younger people who came to the ICU. They were perfectly well. Six hours later, they were very sick. And a few days later, most of them were dead. 11 days into the heat wave, Patrick Negri, a local undertaker, finds himself inundated with calls. There were hundreds of dead people in Paris. So the problem was that since it was very silent, in the sense that as far as the person on the street, as far as the authorities, as far as the politicians, as far as those who are on vacation, no one could imagine what was unfolding. What Paris authorities don't know is that the scorching heat will devastate the city, creating a public health crisis and a public uproar. Heat waves are not a new phenomenon. We've tended to have one or two deadly heat waves every decade in the United States, yet it's only recently that heat waves have been recognized as a major threat to public safety. Dr. Karen Tomic, 
geographer and social advocate, has been working on the front lines of heat waves for 18 years. She knows that despite the fact that heat-related illnesses and deaths are easily preventable, most cities are not prepared for extreme heat. People still don't realize that heat wave mortality doesn't just happen out there to someone else, it can happen to us. Why is it that in this day and age with the kind of technological developments that we have, why is anyone still dying? Often, a severe heat event has to take place before the public and officials realize how deadly hot weather can be. By the time they recognize the threat, it's too late. And that's what happened in Chicago in 1995. Day one, Wednesday, July 12th, a heat wave traveling north from the Great Plains lands over Chicago. Temperatures reach a high of 97 degrees. With the humidity, it feels like 101. The heat wave was predicted three or four days in advance by the National Weather Service. Many heard it first from weatherman Tom Skilling. We accurately forecast the heat, the level of humidity, and the forecasts were right on. There are certain weather events that you know are deadly. I don't think heat was perceived as being one of them. Heat was perceived as an inconvenience. The reaction when you forecast heat was kind of, come on, deal with it. Chicago knuckles down for a hot spell, but this is no ordinary summer heat. We had a hot dome of air. We shut off cloud formation. Uh, eliminated any chance for a thunderstorm that would cool us off and shut down any cool breezes that might have come in off Lake Michigan. Never had an American city had a temperature of that magnitude married to a level of humidity that was that high. Never. Day two, Thursday, July 13th, the hottest day in Chicago ever. The high is 106, but the heat index says it feels like 120 and Chicago silently spirals downward. Roads buckle. Train rails detach. Electrical power outages threaten tens of thousands. Chicago's many neighborhoods find different ways to cope. Those who can turn on their air conditioner. Those without have to be more resourceful. Hazel Montgomery lives on the south side in an area called Inglewood. I was talking a lot on the phone with various friends, and you know, the discussion was how are you staying cool, et cetera, et cetera. This is a brick house. And in those days, you had one fan in the window. I couldn't afford two or three fans like I have now. For relief, local kids opened fire hydrants. That's how we managed in neighborhoods like this was a fire hydrant. They had to find some kind of way to cool off. And that's the way, that's the way we did it. I talked to my friend, Darlene Moore. She lived right across the street there. Darlene seemed fine. But Darlene had health problems. She didn't have a fan. Darlene was sitting by the window trying to get some air. Hazel also has health problems, open heart surgery. She is on oxygen. And that day, she is hard pressed to get a break from the heat. When the late summer sun finally goes down, temperatures stay up, and Hazel gets a devastating phone call. Darlene's daughter had come home and found her sitting by the window dead. And I remember that was a long, terrible night. I thought it was because I was, you know, upset about Darlene. I didn't realize that the heat was getting to me, too. I remember burning in the middle of the night. I didn't know if I was going to survive, if I was going to make it. But for Hazel and others, it was about to get a lot worse. The following day, temperatures would remain at their awful high, pushing the death rate up by a factor of 10, pushing Chicago deeper into crisis. Chicago, Friday, July 14th. The sun comes up on day three of the deadly heat wave. With the heat index at 118, those without AC struggle to keep their bodies from overheating. After a blistering night, Hazel Montgomery still cannot cool down. What she doesn't know is that her body is suffering the effects of heat stress. 
I was trying everything, even a pan of water in front of the fan. I had to do something to try to survive. I was on fire. I was burning. Hazel waits anxiously for her caretaker to arrive. Finally, the doorbell rings. I struggled to get to the door. I was dizzy, and apparently I was a little bit incoherent because she kept saying to me, Miss Montgomery, what's wrong with you? Are you OK? Hazel collapses, and the paramedics are called. The next thing I remember was in the night I was at the hospital. So according to her, I finally just like passed out. It will take Hazel several days to recover from heat exhaustion. She is one of the lucky ones. Thousands are suffering and don't know why. I would describe that as the silent disaster. It just came upon and we just started responding all over the, the city with you know, all the resources that we had available. As I look back, I don't recall of any warning of any type that this was coming. On Friday morning, paramedic Greg Stinnett notices the calls are coming in nonstop and that there's an unmistakable pattern. Most of the incidents that we were responding to were for the elderly. One fatality sticks in Greg's mind, an elderly victim who was typical of the heat's devastating impact. I recall this person sitting in a wheelchair and he was having a seizure. We went to perform our, you know, emergency care on him and he was just just burning up. His temperature was around 110. Just it was awful, you know. Bad news travels throughout the city. Elaine Felon gets a call at work. I can't tell you how I left from Rosemont and went and picked my sister up on 62nd Street. God was my pilot. Elaine rushes home to see about her older brother. James Edward Griffin, I used to call him Big Griff. He was about six feet three, stocky. You know, he was our big brother, and we never worried about anything. We never worried about anything happening to us because we knew that we had him. Big Griff had gone to sleep the night before in his second floor bedroom. My brother's fan was not working, but he had his window open. Sometime during that night, the heat overcame him. And when my sister awoke that morning, she knocked on his door. He didn't respond. And then when she went into his room, um, blood and, um, you know, saliva. You know, it, he just started like, you know, um, salivating, you know. Um, just, you know, all over his face. So that's how we saw him, and that's how he left here. He was 65, so yes, he's lived a full life, but is that a full life, you know, to leave here um, through heat stroke? I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. It's a tragedy that anyone should die from heat waves. They're big, slow moving, and they tend to settle over an area. So a heat wave can't sneak up on you in terms of the weather system coming in. What happens is the heat wave can sneak up on you in terms of the effects that it has. People have individual tolerances for heat. Just a few degrees in body temperature can mean the difference between life and death. When the body is overheated, the heart pumps more blood, and blood vessels expand so the body can cool itself by sweating. Heat exhaustion occurs when there isn't enough blood flow to both cool and run the body. If the outside air is too warm, sweating won't work and the body heats up. At 105 degrees, the patient is in danger of heat stroke and coma. Prompt cooling and replenishing of salts and water is critical to recovery, or heat effects can be fatal. Three days into the heat wave, many in Chicago are now approaching this level of exposure. So many people are getting sick that emergency response systems strain to keep up. Paramedic field officer Cliff Boyce could hear 911 operators over the radio. We've been on the scene for 30 minutes. Is an ambulance coming? And the alarm operators openly pleading on the radio, is there anybody out there that can come up for a run? Is there anybody out there? Anybody? And silence, because everybody was so busy. That Friday, the Chicago Fire Department handles more than a 1,000 calls. 
It was hot. We were tired. I don't ever recall a shift being that busy. By midday, we were just, you know, exhausted. But in this line of work, you kind of reach down and, you know, you just you keep going. And you just you pull out everything you have. Even for an emergency worker like Greg Stinnett, Friday is a very unusual day. Most of the people that we responded to, we didn't actually transport to the hospital because there were a lot of DOAs that day. We see death, you know, we see a lot of things that are tragic, but that many people in one single day was just, it was very unusual. The DOAs, or the bodies found dead on arrival, are taken to the county morgue. 47 autopsies are lined up for the following day, almost three times the normal number. Yet even the paramedics have no idea that Chicago was in the middle of a heat epidemic. You know it all media. They didn't even know it right away. They are just like, it's hot, you know, and they did the typical news story. They were going to fry an egg on a sidewalk, and it's so hot that an ice cube will melt in 13 seconds. They weren't even on top of it. Nobody was. Fitzmorris says if he could have written the news headline during the heat wave, here's what he would have said. I'm going to give you tips to survive. This is a deadly medical emergency. If you don't take these precautions, you risk death. Day four, Saturday, July 15th, is the deadliest day yet. 911 phones are ringing off the hook. Every one of Chicago's 59 ambulances is out on a run. Fire paramedic Patrick Fitzmorris is having trouble finding a hospital that will take a patient. In Chicago, we transport to the closest approved hospital. And then you get there and there's no beds. There's no beds. They had no beds in ICU. They had no beds in the cardiac unit. They had no beds. So they would have to say, we're closing our doors. You got to go somewhere else. So many people need medical attention that on Saturday, 27 of Chicago's 45 hospitals go on bypass meaning more than half of the city's emergency rooms close their doors to new patients. This will become a critical factor in the escalation of the crisis. Jackson Park Hospital on the south side is still open. ER doctor Larry Mitchell gets a call asking him to come in. I figured, well, let me just get in here and start working real fast. You know, I'll get these patients out of here and things will go back to normal and we'll be okay. But Dr. Mitchell is in for a day he'll never forget. You see about 15 or 20 ambulances parked out front. They were basically through the alley and down both sides of the street bringing in patients who were all sick, a temp of about 105, 106 or so, who all had IVs, rapid heartbeats, all in very critical condition. It was completely overwhelming. Patients were coding left and right. These patients were dying right in front of you, and there was very little you can do about it because you only had a certain amount of resources to deal with and a certain amount of staff that can deal with that situation. It was just something that I just had never experienced in my life, and the volume continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's just one hospital. I called around, talked to doctors at other hospitals, and they told me they were having the same situation. Four days into the heat wave, almost 300 people are dead. Those on the front lines begin to wonder if anyone in charge has any idea what's going on. Day five of the Chicago heat wave. Paramedic Cliff Boyce starts another 24-hour shift, a shift where knowing how to save lives might not be enough. The tone of the radio made the hair stand up on my neck. It was very, very scary. You knew that something bad was starting to happen because by 8 o'clock in the morning, I was hearing crews all over the city reporting DOAs, meaning that they were finding people dead. They had been dead for a day or two. Chicago's emergency response system has reached meltdown. All ambulances are out on calls. All fire trucks with medical support are out on calls. Yet the calls keep coming in. Then the tone of the radio changed again. It became like, OK, guys, we're in the middle of a crisis. I remember calling my boss and saying, man, you realize something really bad is easy. I know. He says, I don't know what we can do. He says, we just, we got to keep going to the runs. We got to keep responding. Chicago's hospitals, half of which have stopped receiving new patients, have also reached a breaking point. 
The waiting rooms were full. The emergency rooms were full. People were in hallways waiting for beds. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. You know, I, at times I thought to myself, geez, am I in Chicago or is this a third world? We had more patients then than I'd ever seen before in our emergency department. It was off the map. Dr. Becky Roberts is working in Chicago's largest emergency room at Cook County Hospital. She is fighting to cool her patients down because the longer they remain overheated, the more likely they are to die or suffer permanent damage. They're pale. They're hyperventilating, meaning breathing really fast, quite dehydrated with a low blood pressure, almost in shock. Once the process starts, it's hard to stop. Even if you're already at a hospital, it's hard to stop. But in 1995, Cook County didn't have air conditioning. I had gone to a local hardware store, bought a bunch of fans, went to a plant store and bought those plant misters because the most vital thing when you're treating a heat stroke or heat exhaustion patient is to cool them. This low-tech solution is not a match for the sheer number of people in deep trouble. At some point, I became worried about even our ability to care for patients who were coming in. Once they came into our emergency department, we started to feel like we were unable to cool them fast enough. That afternoon, Chicago hospitals are ordered off bypass and told to institute their internal disaster plans, dedicating all resources to the ER. But it's too late. We're a day late and a dollar short, trying to figure out why isn't it that this thing is it considered a disaster. Because it is a disaster, and we should, and everybody knows it's a disaster. I just remember bodies. You know, the amount of bodies, and I kept thinking in my back of my mind, who's going to count all these bodies? 24 hours later, the Chicago heat wave finally breaks. But the extent of its impact is just beginning to emerge. Days later, the Centers for Disease Control came to Chicago to investigate. A profile emerged of those who died. Many were like Hazel Montgomery, but not as lucky. Most were 65 years or older, living alone with a medical condition and without air conditioning. Rates of deaths were highest on Chicago's south side, in neighborhoods with high levels of poverty and crime. These people not only didn't have air conditioning, they may have been afraid to open a window or go outside. They were isolated from family, from friends, from social services. These people lived alone, died alone. In some cases, they weren't found for several days after they died. We're talking about an area here of incredible vulnerability. The poor, the elderly, and the isolated. Most of this largely neglected population didn't have the money to buy an air conditioner or couldn't afford to pay for power. The CDC would later report that one air conditioner per house would have prevented more than 50% of the deaths. But the heat wave also revealed that Chicago never perceived heat as capable of causing a significant loss of life. Chicago was totally unprepared to deal with what happened in 1995. The response was totally uncoordinated. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. And even when the body counts were increasing, even when it was becoming clear to more and more people that this was a major public health emergency, it still wasn't getting through to the upper levels of the administration. Had there been some greater understanding of what was going on, many lives, no doubt, would have been saved. Eight years later, the same troubling patterns would play out in Europe. Another heat wave would strike in one of the greatest cities in the world. The heat wave would last not one week, but two, and it would kill on a scale no one could have imagined. Not hundreds, but tens of thousands of people. At the center of the disaster is Paris, France. August 8, 2003. Paris has been in the grip of a heat wave for a week. For several days, temperatures have reached unprecedented highs of 100 degrees or more. Many Parisians have left town. In August, everyone who can get away goes on vacation. But those who remain behind are seeing something very disturbing. Something wasn't right. I began to have that feeling around August 6th that there was something that didn't fit. Something was going on in the city. 
Dr. Patrick Pelou is an emergency room doctor at St. Antoine Hospital. There were people who came in with a body temperature of 104, 107. We even had one with 111. Also, we know the neighborhood police officers. We know the firefighters, and they explained to us that they were finding a lot of people deceased in their homes. Dr. Jean Carlet is head of the intensive care unit at Hospital St. Joseph. He is also troubled by what he is seeing. Hypotension, high-grade fever, and coma. The number of those people increased every day. It was exponential. What the doctors suspected was in fact true. The extreme heat was making those left in Paris sick, and it was killing them. When the heat arrived a week earlier, few knew it was an extreme heat incident. But Matteo France, France's National Weather Service, knew they were seeing a rare event. We got temperature up to 44.1 degrees, which is a record in our climate. It was exceptional because of its duration with this intensity, about 12 days overall. And last but not least, it was exceptional because of its extent. The full territory of France was affected. Aware of the potential danger, Matteo France issues a health advisory and forecasts even worse weather to come. But the warnings are not heard by government officials. We communicated well, but there was no uh, uh, real impact because the communication was not, there uh, were no relays to the communication to the authorities and so on. So it, it came more or less into the void, if you want. The killer heat wave brings Paris its hottest weather in a hundred years. It could not have come at a worse time. Many government authorities are on vacation. Few can conceive how hot the city is and how many people are dying. As in Chicago, the elderly are the most vulnerable. A lot of the medical support was away. You had reduced staff hours. And the social support was also gone. So a lot of elderly people had been left behind while their families were able to escape. Postal worker Therese Belanger worries more and more about the elderly on her route. She knows many of them are alone, and she checks them every morning during the heat wave. I'm always there, and in 2003, more so. With the heat, I was much more afraid, and I often went back in the afternoon to see if they were all right. One day, Therese sees that her friend Bertha's shutters are closed. I ring the bell. They usually answer me. Suddenly, I get goosebumps because I said to myself, oh dear, something's wrong. Therese calls Bertha's children. They arrive and call the paramedics. Bertha is rushed to the hospital. The paramedics told me that if her children hadn't come that evening, she would have been dead. That's one case, and there were other cases. Just like Chicago, the heat is killing hundreds of elderly people, and the city is not mobilized to react. By the second week, Patrick Pelou believes that Paris is in crisis and that a catastrophe is unfolding. As the president of the Emergency Room Doctors Union in Paris, Dr. Pelou goes on television August 10th to sound the alarm. What did I hope for? I hoped for the impossible. I hoped for the impossible for the hospitals to be mobilized, for the army to be mobilized. What I hoped was to save a maximum number of lives. The next day, the Minister of Public Health, Jean-Francois Maté, issues a statement from his holiday home where he is vacationing and downplays the threat. There is no massive overflow in the emergency services. The difficulties encountered are comparable to those in previous years. That was the knife in the back. That was the Monday night when the Secretary of Health said that everything was fine, that nothing was going on. We had the impression that we were being passed under a blowtorch, that we were burning, that Paris was burning. And so we hoped to see things arrive, resources, and we saw nothing coming. It was unbelievable. In the days ahead, the heat wave would become even more deadly. And it was the bodies that would finally get everyone's attention. Because there are so many bodies, Paris will run out of places to put them. Paris has been suffocating for 10 days. Daytime highs are 103. Even nighttime temperatures stay high, setting records for August 11th and 12th, and death rates skyrocket. 
ce qui tue les organismes. What kills the body is the fact that it doesn't recuperate between the temperature in the day and the temperature at night. It's the small difference between these temperatures, almost as if the body couldn't adapt. On the front lines of the crisis, emergency workers and doctors wage an all-out war to save people. It was very, very hard. There were people who arrived dead. There were people who came in with a body temperature of 104, 107. Downstairs, we no longer had room to set up stretchers. We were three doctors, and in fact, we stayed at the hospital. We worked nine consecutive days. We had many people coming to the ICU with heat stroke. Mortality is around 50%. The only thing you have to do is to put them in a very cool uh, environment. But in addition to lacking beds, doctors and nurses, many Paris hospitals don't have air conditioning. In Chicago, victims couldn't afford air conditioning. In Paris, air conditioning is generally considered unnecessary. In 2003, only 6% of French homes had air conditioning and even fewer hospitals. No air conditioning is a risk factor for death. So many people died in the ICUs in which they had no uh, air conditioning. August 12, 2003, temperatures go to 104, and dead bodies pile up everywhere. Patrick Negri works for Pomp Funèbre Générale, France's largest funeral home network. His services are suddenly in high demand. I found myself on call for all the Paris offices as of 6 p.m., and I was flooded with calls. The dead are everywhere. Police, family, and neighbors call to report deaths in hospitals, in retirement homes, and city apartments. You would have a local police station calling you and saying, I've got 15 bodies I need picked up from my arrondissement. In a neighboring arrondissement, I have 18 bodies to be picked up. Picked up. The victims are finally visible, and the bodies are causing problems because all the morgues are full. We would find ourselves in the middle of Paris and on the outskirts of Paris with death and bodies and nowhere to put them. The bodies must be put in cold storage immediately or they'll cause another problem, contamination and disease. To handle the overflow, the Institut Medico Legal a morgue normally reserved for deaths of a suspicious nature is forced to open its doors, but the dead will overwhelm the morgue too. Within three days, the IML was full. They had received 750 bodies. Imagine that. It's huge. I had access to the IML, where they have quite a big disaster room. They opened up their doors to me, and it was unreal. There were bodies everywhere. With the morgue full, Paris needs a new place to store the dead. Christian Raffo, who runs a body transport business, is hired to build a storage room. They called me at 8 in the morning, and around 10 o'clock in the evening, the cold room was operating. It was barely completed, this cold room, when bodies started arriving. Paris exudes death. Day and night, Raffo, Negri, and others travel the city to perform the gruesome work of retrieving the dead. We go in a group. Since there's several of us, it's already less stressful. We know we're going to see something ugly. Every situation is different, but we're used to it, and we put up a wall. When a body begins to be in a state of putrefaction or decomposition, well, it swells up, it changes color, it blackens, it vomits, fluids come out of everywhere, it sweats. The temporary storage room fills up quickly. Next, the refrigerated warehouses used to store food for the Paris area are requisitioned to store the dead. Thousands of bodies must be carefully identified, tracked, and prepared for burial. The number of deaths is overwhelming, yet the undertakers find that few understand the dimensions of the disaster. It was an unprecedented event. But if you said that to someone who was at the beach or someone who was a civil servant, well, they didn't react. Or they would say, looks like he was out partying all night. He's telling tall stories. That's really what struck me the most. Christian Raffaut felt compelled to record what he was seeing, 
and shot over 500 pictures. I feel there was an obligation to record it because it was exceptional. And even I, at the time, found it exceptional. I considered that it was extraordinary, and few people can say they realized that. Few people. It wasn't until the dead were counted and buried that Parisians realized the magnitude of the disaster. And the public demanded to know, how did hot weather kill thousands of people in the greater Paris area? The extraordinary number of fatalities would force many in Paris to examine what happened. Parisians had assumed they would never be the victims of an extreme heat wave. This assumption proved to be fatal. Even simple protective measures would have saved lives. One of the factors that made the Paris heat wave so deadly was that there was nowhere to go to cool off. There's very little air conditioning in Paris, so people don't have it in their homes, and worse yet, it's not in the hospitals. With high nighttime temperatures and nowhere to go to cool off, Parisians died where they should have been safe. 42% in hospitals, 35% at home, and 19% in retirement homes. In both Chicago and Paris, the same populations got sick and died. It's exactly like the scene in Chicago. In other words, it's basically the poor. In the plural, the poor who were affected. Those who were physically poor, mentally poor. Poor in terms of being elderly, socially poor. Because there were few measures in place to protect this marginal group, people got sick in exponential numbers. Public hospitals in Paris reported 2,600 excess ER visits and almost 2,000 more hospital admissions than usual. With no disaster plan in place, the volume of patients forced the Paris health system right past the breaking point. This was not just a malfunctioning of the system. This was complete system breakdown. The Paris 2003 heat wave completely overwhelmed the system. It required resources that were far beyond anything the city could even begin to provide. The Paris heat wave drew international attention and provoked public outrage. Parisians wanted to know why so many died and what would be done to protect them in the future. When the temperatures finally drop in Paris and Chicago, the political heat is turned up high. You have to look at the facts, because if this goes for seven or eight days, everybody dies, cannot be attributed strictly to heat. Politicians scrambled to explain what happened, what they knew, how many were killed, and who was to blame. Government officials seem to be the last to understand the severity of the problem. Chicago's Deputy Health Commissioner John Willem didn't become aware of the heat wave's impact till Saturday, when it was almost over. I was asked to do an on-camera interview, and on camera, I'll, I'll never forget this, uh, the uh, reporter asked me if I was aware that there were 70 police squadrons lined up at the medical examiner's office with bodies. I could only imagine what my face might have looked like. People continued to die from heat effects several days after the heat wave ended adding to the political embarrassment. Every morning, I would open up the door, and on the front page would be a running total, a tally, of the number of heat-related deaths. At that point, there was nothing that could be done, and that was very painful. In both cities, government officials later acknowledged that the silent killer had caught them off guard. There was no real perception of a threat. So uh, when Météo France uh, announced this heat wave, well, it, it was an information which was not connected with a real threat concerning health. That was the problem. The impact of the heat waves was shocking. The sheer number of bodies focused attention on just how deadly heat waves could be. 733 perished in Chicago. 5,000 died in Paris and the surrounding suburbs. The number of people killed during the summer of 2003 in Europe were even more stunning. The total is now estimated at 52,000. What we saw in Paris in 2003, Chicago in 1995, that's going to become more common. In the future, we can expect more heat waves. They're going to last longer. They're going to be higher intensity. And they're going to occur in cities that have not experienced them before. 
Many experts believe that the increased frequency of heat waves is caused by global warming. While some aspects of this process are disputed, the National Academy of Sciences has determined that the Earth's temperature has been increasing one degree Fahrenheit per year in the last century. The result is hotter temperatures. We can expect to see more heat waves because we're in a situation of global warming. 1990s were the hottest decade on record, and 2005 has broken the record that was set in 1998. So this is what we're gonna be seeing more of. We need to get used to this. We're starting to get a glimpse of what the future is, and it's heat. This is a monthly test of the emergency alert system. If this had been an actual emergency in the San Diego area, official messages would have followed the alert tones. Russia, India, and China. In the U.S., the area from Washington, D.C. to New York and cities like Chicago and St. Louis are particularly vulnerable. With global warming, we can expect to see that more cities will be at risk. Cities that are further north are going to be experiencing heat waves, some of them for the first time. Nothing will stop heat waves from occurring in the near future. But what can change is our response to them. In Paris and Chicago today, the response is substantially different. We're attacking the heat. We're thinking forward. We're like, <laughs> what's, what's the worst case scenario? What's going to happen tonight? How bad could this possibly be? How are we going to respond to it? In the fall of 1995, Chicago's Mayor Daley established a commission on extreme weather conditions to determine what kind of weather constitutes a public threat. You need a dew point of 75. You need a heat index of 100, 105 for three consecutive days. Uninterrupted sunshine. Three nights with temperatures in the upper 70s or higher. When those con combination of events come together, then you put out what's called an excessive heat warning. Today, when the National Weather Service issues a heat warning, the city of Chicago can activate an emergency plan. More than 20 city agencies will respond to the threat. We're on top of it in every way. Department of Human Services, the Health Department, Department of Aging, Streets and Sanitation, you name it. I mean, they're all out there. Anything we need, you know, bands, a phone call away. And we're checking with all of the senior citizens to see if everything But that's not all. During a heat emergency, the city of Chicago makes as many as 40,000 phone calls per day to people who may be at risk. Paris also established an emergency warning plan. Block captains go building to building checking on the elderly. And like Chicago, thousands are registered to receive a daily call from the city. Maybe it's the best homage we can pay to those 15,000 dead is to have modernized the links between the hospitals, the city, the emergency services, Matteo France, the Health Watch, etc. It's a tragedy that anyone should die from heat waves. Heat waves are easy to predict. And heat related mortality is relatively inexpensive and easy to prevent. But the key to doing this is to have a plan in place. Once you start to see the bodies mounting up, it's too late. La canicule de l'été 2003 en France est un exemple. The heat wave of 2003 in France is a very important and essential example in understanding the effects of global warming and the risks involved for modern and wealthy civilizations, uh, which thought they were immune to disaster. Qui, parce qu'elles étaient modernes et riches, se croyaient protégées de toute catastrophe. It's completely Or, false. Faux. The heat waves in Paris and Chicago redefined how many look at heat. Now authorities know heat must be taken seriously and cities must be prepared. It was our Katrina, it was, uh, it was my Katrina. It was something I would never forget. It's very unfortunate that we had to lose so many lives to get the attention before they would understand that these neighborhoods existed, that people were over here. Now it's hot. I check on my family, make sure they're okay. I check on my crews, and then I check on the citizens to make sure that they're okay. The next time something like that happens, I'm gonna be the first one on the phone and call in everybody because I'll never let that happen again.